Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi broadcasting live from New York, the home of Photoshelter.com. We have another episode of I Love Photography live for you. Hopefully, you're watching us on YouTube at youtube.com slash Photoshelter, or you're listening to us on our podcast through iTunes by searching for I Love Photography. Whatever the case is, you can always send us comments or shout-outs or questions by tweeting us at hashtag I Love Photo. And you can get all the links that we talk about today on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Sarah Jacobs. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Alan. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, we start off on uh, uh, a tragic note as, unfortunately, it seems like we do this every couple months. Um, but as everyone knows by now, uh, photojournalist Jim Foley was executed uh, by ISIS, um, and that video was uploaded to YouTube, and uh, it's really screwed up. It's really, really screwed up. You know, it's one thing to be in a conflict zone and, you know, be hit by a by mortar, um, like Chris Andros. It's another thing to be captured and then executed so brutally in the way that they did with Jim Foley. Jim Foley, ironically, uh, a few of us in the office met Jim Foley um, when we were supporting uh, an in initiative called Friends of Anton. So another photojournalist who was killed in Libya, Anton Hamerl, um, Jim was a big supporter of that. And uh, so uh, a few of us met him uh, a couple years ago, uh, and then, you know, he was captured almost two years ago and has been in captivity and uh, I guess despite the US trying to uh, get him out of there um, ISIS which is becoming a, a bigger and bigger problem executed him um, and I, I don't know what to say more than that I, I think it's uh, you know I've read some statistics Sarah that say that the world is actually the safest it's been in a long time. There are fewer wars, there are fewer conflicts, less people are dying from disease, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe it's because of this information superhighway that's, that's available to us on our phones and on our computers that we're just more aware of things nowadays. But it sure seems like the world is in a great place right now, you know, with stuff like this. The... Um James reported for the Global Post, and the Global Post currently has up the best of his reporting. Um, and there's one uh, story at the top where he, it's a six minute video, and he's re he recounts being captured in Libya under Gaddafi's rule, and the story is just riveting. I mean, one of his um, colleagues got killed right in front of him. This was in 2011. Um, and just the bravery that this man had. I mean, he was used as an example, you know, being executed. And he, I mean, even after what had happened to him in Libya, he still wanted to go out there and, and tell the people's story. And it's just, like, what a brave guy. <laughs> yeah, so. I was listening to uh, NPR Fresh Air this morning, and they had a, an interview with his boss from the Global Post. And they said after he was initially captured in Libya and released, he came back to the U.S. and his boss said, hey, why don't you just work, yeah, we'll make you a full-time employee, you can work as an editor. And they said he, he, he did that job and he just wasn't happy and he was sort of itching to get back and do what he did best, do what he knew what to do and that was uh, be a photojournalist. So tragic, um, uh, but, but I guess in, in some ways uh, you know, he, he was out there doing what he did, uh, doing what he wanted to do. It was interesting to see um, the reaction of both YouTube and Twitter. YouTube, of course, took down the video uh, immediately. Immediately in internet time isn't fast enough because obviously people can do screen grabs and download uh, things from YouTube. Uh, and then Dick Costolo, who is the CEO of Twitter, uh, tweeted out this, which said, uh, we're actively 
uh, suspending accounts as we discover them related to this graphic imagery. And there was some concern raised over whether they should be doing this or not. Um, is Twitter a news outlet? Should they be allowing news to uh, be broadcast over their medium? Other people right, we're said, censoring it. Yeah, yeah. And other people said it's not a news organization. It's a conduit for information. And they are exercising an ethical viewpoint. And I understand the slippery slope of saying, okay, we're going to censor this, but we're not going to censor this. I think in this case, there's no... You know, a guy is beheaded. There's no value in showing that. There's literally no value in showing that. And yeah, he's forced forced to read a statement, you know, that's anti-American yeah. that he, you know, that he didn't believe, and then beheaded. Like, there's no. You're right. There's no value in watching that. And 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 people, you know, there's always going to be a segment of people who are attracted to the gore. Um, but the fact of the matter is. Once you see that, you can't unsee it. You can't unsee something so gruesome like that. And it's going to stick with you for a very, very long time. As a lot of people who have experienced horrendous trauma will, will attest. This stuff is not good for your brain. It's just not good for your brain. So I, I actually think it was a good thing. Now, ironically, you know, Twitter made this call. YouTube made this call. And then the New York Post and the Daily News, who these, these organizations are provocateurs, and, and we're sort of used to, especially in New York, seeing them come up with you know, these corny, punny headlines and then using imagery that can be very, very provocative and sometimes offensive. And they used a screen grab of the moment before his throat was slit, both the New York Post and the Daily News. And I, I just have to say, th this is tasteless. They, they have to have, they ha there has to be a line for these guys. And they cross the line. They, and it's just sad, you know. It's, it's like, this is an American. This was a journalist. You guys are a, ostensibly a journalistic <laughs> newspaper. Sort of. <laughs> and in order to sell papers, and I'm sure they came up with some BS justification this is news, and we have to show the the you know the atrocities of war. You don't have to put that on the cover. No, I mean the New York Post. Ever since they ran that image of the man in the New York subway about to be run over, I just have completely lost yeah. any any drop of respect that was even there in the first place. Yeah. So yeah. So to all of the the colleagues of James Foley, and obviously to his family and friends, our, our heartfelt condolences. Uh, a tragic, tragic moment. Um, yet another photojournalist killed in the line of duty. Um, things weren't so better. You know, we, we talked last week about Ferguson, and so much has transpired in, in the past week with more tear gassing and some rioting and protesting and cops it, pointing guns at people's faces. And arrests of journalists as and well. And arrests of journalists. Um, so I was in St. Louis uh, yesterday, and I drove into Ferguson. Um, and uh, thankfully, things had quieted down quite a bit. And other than a few businesses that had been boarded up, we know that uh, one of the, the liquor stores and mini marts um, had been ransacked. Um, and a couple other businesses had been ransacked, so they were boarded up. Um, and other than that, and, and, and obviously some police presence, but not, not overwhelming police presence like it had been in, you know, earlier in the week or last week, it kind of looked just like a normal town. What what time of day were you out? I went out around 2 p.m. It was blazingly hot. It was the hottest day of the year so far for them. So it was it was kind of in the upper 90s, and uh, my 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 car was saying it was you know 100 degrees. Mm. Um, so it was really too hot for anything to be going on in the first place. So I think even if tensions were heightened, people would be like, you know what, we're gonna go out at night. And at night it was still upper 80s. Mm. Um, but, but it was strange to see uh, graffiti on a lot of things that said uh, R.I.P. Mike Brown. Uh, it was interesting to see people hawking t-shirts that said don't shoot uh, with the silhouette of a guy with his hands raised. And then later uh, la uh, last night, 
uh, we met up with a bunch of photographers, including David Carson, who we interviewed last week, who is one of the photographers at the Post Dispatch, who has just been. These guys have been killing it. These guys have been shooting, and and you know, I was talking to someone else, and and th this has got to be nominated for a Pulitzer. The coverage that they've that this staff has been doing has been exemplary. Um, and you know, we looked at this photo last week, Robert Cohen's photo of of the guy throwing back the tear gas canister. And I was talking to uh, Drew Selman, who's a photographer out there, and he said only Robert Cohen would be able to get this shot where the guy's throwing back the canister in the American flag T-shirt. And then he mentioned something that I didn't see in the photo: holding a bag of chips and not dropping it. Look at his left hand. Oh my God. He's holding a bag of chips. <laughs> oh, a bag of chips. I've been wondering what that was. Yeah, it's a bag of chips. So anyway, if you haven't seen, you know, there have been a lot of compilations of material from Ferguson, and Time Lightbox did a really nice one. But um, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch has been doing kind of a serialized feed of all of their photographers' works. Um, there are about four, four photographers that are out there from their staff covering stuff. And they've been there since... The exact moment Since that it began, the beginning, yeah, which and starting special. with this photo of Mike Brown's mom, which is like so touching. You know, you just see the pain in her face, and you know, we talk about humanizing, removing stereotypes, and humanizing a problem. We've talked about that continuously as a as a as a goal of photography. And how can you not feel for this woman who's lost her son? You know. Yeah, it's a powerful image. So you're you're calling it now, Alan. You think one of these is going to be for up for Pulitzer? I, I think they they need to be nominated. I think they definitely will be nominated, and 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 I would be surprised if they didn't win the Pulitzer. Yeah, this is as good as any other coverage that I've seen. Absolutely, absolutely, um, and it's it's the most uh, I I'd say well rounded. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, the interesting thing, talking to David, too, because I, I, I kind of wanted to get, I was hoping to get to Ferguson and get the word on the street and get the non-press view of Ferguson, but everything had dispersed, thankfully. But talking to David and saying, hey, what, you know, what's the dealio here? And I said, uh, uh, who, did, the, did the police fire the, the, the tear gas first? And he goes, no. Somebody from the crowd shot at the police, and the and the snipers who were on top of the of that vehicle heard the bullets whiz past them, and then two seconds later the, they got the okay to launch the tear gas. And what he said to me, and I said, okay, and was the was the press targeted with tear gas? And he goes, uh, yeah. And then he said, but you have to understand that there was press, and there was. Sort of press, and he he phrased it in such a way as like I, I don't want to be pejorative because I understand how the world works nowadays. It's not just the St. Louis Post Dispatch and the New York Times. There's a lot of other outlets that do news, and there's Twitter and blah blah blah. But he said, you know, the traditional press understands sort of the rules of engagement. We know that you know when there's a conflict going on, the photographer shouldn't get in the sight line of the police because you're going to get shot. And he said there were journalists who are there taking photos and there were activist journalists who when the governor says something they would they would cheer and th they're not showing neutrality in the way that if you went to school for journalism you'd know you don't do that you can't you can't show outward bias that way uh, and he said yeah there were cops who you know cops from these small towns who are obviously not the smartest guys and obviously have been let go for from one force and go to the next town of 5,000 and join that force because they don't do background checks. Uh, you know, as we mentioned with the Gaza-Israel uh, Gaza conflict, there's misbehavior on all sides. Well, I think that's why so, so many people were surprised when Scott Olson from Getty Images was arrested this past week. Yeah. Because, you know, he is obviously very highly trained photojournalist, knows the rules, you know, and was still arrested, and and really not doing anything like crossing the street. Right. They said you didn't get out of the way fast enough. It's like really, you can't give the guy two seconds, and it was in daylight. It's like, what's the threat? Right. Right. Exactly. Well, speaking of Scott Olson, you know, we've seen his fantastic coverage, and he snagged two magazine covers 
uh, with two very, very different photos, and I thought that was super interesting. So this is Bloomberg Business Week, um, and a little girl uh, surrounded by what well, looks like two two young boys with her hands up in that in that that pose. Don't shoot! I'm unarmed. And, and with then, the baby bottle in front of yeah, her. Yeah, with the baby I mean, bottle. Yeah. And then this one, you know, to show you the contrast, here's an adult in with the same pose, but silhouetted by a, a flash bang grenade. Um, I, I got to tell you, these these photographers, just you know, Scott and the guys at the Post Dispatch and some of her other friends, you know, Eric Thayer, Matt Eich, all these guys were out there, really, really doing phenomenal, phenomenal work, and. And again, like this, this street, West Florissant, is just like a normal looking street. It's not a photogenic street. There's nothing remarkable about it, and yet they're able to capture such great photography. So I'm really, really I'm so proud of these guys going out there. And obviously, they, I mean, they're all veterans, so, you know, what can you say? Um, speaking of photojournalists, uh, there is a video online. So Slate.com partnered with the Brooklyn Brewery. The founder of the Brooklyn Brewery was a former Associated Press for foreign correspondents. So they're doing these little panels over there at the Brooklyn Brewery. And they had Todd Heisler, um, Pulitzer Prize winning photographer who is with the New York Times now. At any, and it's, a, it's an interesting panel discussion and he says, you know, even though there are many instances of, of uh, mobile phone photography uh, being important for for covering spot news, um, and he brings up the London tube bombing, and he said that you know the first images coming out of that were people's cell phones. He said that the iPhone is never going to replace the photojournalist, and not because of the technology, but because of the person operating the device. He makes the point that. The, the guy who's in the tube when the bomb goes off is there for that moment and then they're out of there. And they're, they're documenting that moment, but they're not trying to, to tell a story. They're not trying to investigate. They're not trying to show multiple sides of the story. And I thought it was such a, in some ways, a very obvious statement, but in other ways, we're so enamored nowadays with the cell phone photography that it kind of reminded us that it's not the device, it's the person and the brains behind it and the intent behind the reporting. Yeah, that um, him just talking about the importance of that, the documentation of the analysis of the aftermath, you know, that's what the photojournalist brings to the story. It's not yeah. just the actual event of what happened. And I think this is especially important given what happened this week with James Foley. I mean, he was out there telling the full stories um, and you couldn't have done that with an iPhone. <laughs> no. And no, you know, what civilian is going to say, I'm going to go into harm's way to try to tell a story. Exactly. Right? There right. are people who do this for a living, and, 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 and so they should be celebrated, and they should be compensated, and, and, and you know, newspapers and magazines should realize that this is a, a crucial function. As we say over and over again, we're preaching to the choir. Of course, we love photography. That's the name of the show. <laughs> <laughs> I love photography. <laughs> Um, I saw this on CNN last night, and Bring it, it up. is uh, portraits. So th they have a problem in India, and in in a lot of places where where male dominated society and misogyny rules. But India has a particular problem um, with acid attacks. They 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 for whatever reason uh, uh, they feel like throwing acid and disfiguring a woman is, a, is justice. Now, I mentioned misogyny being a part of it, but this first example was actually a woman throwing acid on another woman, so we shouldn't necessarily restrict it to that. But these are portraits, um, it's called a fashion shoot featuring acid attack survivors. And these women uh, survived horrific, horrific injury, and, and then years later they said okay we'll we're down now we're down to like be photographed yeah it's pretty pretty incredible to get to that place in your life they've been these women have been living in a safe house together um, building friendships and you know being able to connect with people that 
have gone through what they're what they're going through. It's tragic. So what was what was your reaction to these photos? Um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, the fact that they're fashion photos. <laughs> one one of the women makes clothes. That made more sense after I found out that fact. Yeah. One of the women is a seamstress and a, and a designer, so she's been designing these clothes, and they wanted to document the clothes. Um, I think the pictures, I think they're beautiful, and I think these women, you know, are allowed to pose the way they want to. They were doing it themselves. I, I saw the behind-the-scenes video. It was mm -hmm. a male photographer who organized it. Um, I think they're great. They, 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 they were tough for me to look at yeah. because of the disfigurement. And I guess that's part of it, um, th that as, as much as sort of internally I want to be okay with the, the images and the way they look, you, you can't help but be shocked by the appearance. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it very jarring. Um, I wouldn't say upsetting. That would be overstating the, the situation. Um, but it's not something where I would, I'd be walking down the street and be like, oh, that's totally normal. She was attacked with acid. You know, everything's cool. Well, I think the images that you're used to seeing of, of women like this and victims like this is, is much more moody. You know, maybe it's a, a fine art, black and white. You know, you see it as like, I don't know, it has more of a mood than these yeah. do. Yeah. And so that's, what you're, that's the imagery that we're used to seeing of victims like this. And, and I think it's refreshing and, and good and healthy for these women for it to be in a totally different light than that. So speaking of controversial images... I've, you know, I walk a lot, as you know, Sarah, and I've been walking up West Broadway, and I, and I saw these huge uh, images in this gallery of, like, a naked little girl. And every time I walked by, I was like, what the heck is that? And I don't want to look. It's, like, really weird, man. It's really weird. And I thought to times where, like, my friend's kids would come out, like, naked. You know, they're, like, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. And they'd come out naked and they'd be like, hey, in the way that little kids do. <laughs> Except it's, it seems to be okay when it's like your kids, but when they're not your kids, you're like, ooh. <laughs> so then we come across this exhibit by a photographer named Wyatt Newman. And Wyatt had posted uh, this image and a few others. He was traveling around with his daughter, two-year-old daughter Stella, on a cross-country road trip. And he posted this, this image of the daughter and then all of a sudden, people got really bent out of shape. Uh, they said, this is disgusting, this is child pornography. And he said, this is crazy. No, it's not. And he came up with a project called, what's it called again? <laughs> uh, I feel sorry for your children. All caps. Yeah. I feel sorry for your children. Uh, and the subtitle is The Sexualization of Innocence in America. Yeah, he was, I mean... Not, not only were people just commenting, they, they shut, this anonymous group shut down, was able to shut down his Instagram and Facebook account right. because that's right. where he was posting these images. Well, both of those, both Instagram and Facebook, in, in part because they're the same company, have no nudity policies. So I can understand just saying, okay, listen, it doesn't matter whether they're a kid or not, we have no nudity policy. On the other hand, I kind of see his point. It, it makes me uncomfortable to look at these images. Um, but I think, like, his point is that we've been so indoctrinated by, by media to reject images of a naked child because, you know, these horrific stories of pedophilia and, and, and child pornography, you know, that's always like a, a headline whenever it happens. You know, 500 people busted in child pornography ring, da 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 yeah, there's some sick people out there who want to look at this stuff. And then there's just like parents who are like, this is my child. What's the big deal? Right, this is my child. I'm a photographer. I take pictures. Yeah, and I want to document this stuff. Right. Yeah, you know, this, uh, this controversy reminds me of Sally Mann's photos who have also come, on, come under a lot of hot water, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I was trying to think. I mean, there's a difference between Sally Mann's work and this guy's. Um, in that Why, because she, it's more artistic? Well, not necessarily, but she wasn't posting those images on social media, you know? So she was presenting it in a different way um, through fine art galleries or, you know, published book, works of, you know, books. Um, 
And I feel like there is, he kind of does need to protect his daughter because there obviously are perverts and creeps out there. Yeah, that's true. And maybe he does need, yeah, to protect her and only show it in a gallery rather than posting it on Instagram. So uh, I, I guess that, that brings up kind of a slippery slope of like what photos a photographer should be, quote, allowed to put on social media. Yeah. You know, what if I have a teenage daughter in a bikini? Should that be, if I take a photo of her that's artistic, should that only be shown in a gallery because there are sickos out there? Right, yeah, that is a slippery slope. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> but I, know, I, I totally know what you mean because there's a, there's a, there's, you know, there's a long history of photographers posting sort of lascivious images. You, you mentioned Sally Mann. Jock Sturges always comes to mind um, because he shot prepubescent kids large format, 8 by 10 they're beautiful images, but again, he didn't, you know, these, these people didn't grow up in the age of social media, um, and they were trying to sell their images for thousands and thousands of dollars, so of course they're not going to put it on social media because it's going to get ripped off, et cetera, et cetera, but... Right. Well, yeah. I do think the public's reaction to this, which was very overwhelming, uh, kind of shows America's, our Puritan roots and our obsessed, ob sex-obsessed culture, like... Yeah. Very, very over the top. So yeah, what he's doing for the gallery showing is posting their their comments next to the images of his daughter. Which I think is, yeah, it's more social commentary than anything else. You know, it does make me think, like, here's a lovely photo of his daughter. Um, and there were, some, there were some, you know, lovely photos of her, you know, pulling up her dress, which is like what little girls do and little boys do. So then you have to ask the question, like, do we really need to have like the full frontal nudity of the child on social media? I, I mean, I'm always one to like fight the power and you know artistic freedom. Yeah, I think you could use a little more discretion. Right. I think posting to social media, yeah, maybe using more discretion. But with the show, it's different. It's a, it's in a different setting. Yeah. Speaking of outlaws, you found this one, <laughs> and I started following this guy. Yeah, this guy's great. Well, you know, Alan, you posted uh, on the Photo Shelter blog last week about, you know, do good stories trump good photographs? Yes. You know, like, does the story have to be better? And I think this is a great example of the story and the images being both fantastic. So this is a 17-year-old photog photographer, Homza Dees. Um, who's been exploring New York City at night, and he goes and climbs on top of everything, it looks like. Buildings, bridges, billboards, all types of stuff. And then takes these, like, incredible night shots and posts them on Instagram. I mean, he's basically, I mean, he's combining photography with, like, urban exploration, and it's just to get the shot. And the article compares him and, you know, the kids that are doing this to, really, to graffiti artists because it really is about making the shot and making the art and not, I mean, it's, it's about the exploration as well, but it's about getting the likes, you know? It's like, how high can I go up and how many likes can I get for it? <laughs> I've been following him on Instagram and he's obviously like just blown up because of this article and he continues to pull, like, I don't know how he has so many incredible <laughs> images. This one that we're looking at is shot actually right next to my house. Um, it's like a block away from my house. Uh, Oh, so awesome. he's obviously, you know, he's using a long shutter. He's obviously not using an iPhone to get these. Um, he's doing a little bit of post-processing because I think he's, he's, you know, pulling down the highlights a little bit so that, that they're not totally blown out. The, the guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. Both in terms of photography, post-production, climbing. Climbing. Storytelling. <laughs> Being Spider-Man. Yeah. No, it's cool. You know, it makes me... It makes me a little jealous, you know. I wish I, well, I wish I was 17 again and didn't didn't care about like potentially falling and all that kind of stuff that old people have to worry about. I know these guys are not afraid of heights. Definitely worth following this guy, Hamza Diaz or Diaz or something like that. Um, we like to talk about not just photography as an entity unto itself, but the the way that it's used in culture, et cetera, and I came across this on The Verge. So the Los Angeles uh, uh, Museum, uh, County Museum of Art, which is a fantastic museum. Uh, if, if you've never been there, you should definitely check it out. Um, but somebody took over the Snapchat account. Now, we know a lot of brands have embraced 
Instagram, but I haven't seen a whole lot of brands actually embrace Snapchat. Yeah, and do it this uh, smart. <laughs> yeah, they're being a bit subversive in the way that they do it. Um, and so they're putting, you know, Snapchat is all about taking a photo and then putting kind of snarky comments on it or drawing on it and whatnot. So here's one in the upper left here, uh, and, the, and the caption is all the single ladies because it looks like the Beyonce dance from the video. And like a, you know, this classical painting that says, you can't sit with us. Um, and this art piece that says, Soldier Boy or Nah. So they're very contemporary references. So you kind of got to be down to get it. But that's, that's sort of fitting with the demographic of, of, uh, of Snapchat. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bunch of 13-year-olds using Snapchat. This yeah. is Yeah, this is super great. I, I wonder if this was like Lachma's intern that came up with this. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, their 13-year-old intern who came yeah. up with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love it because, you know, Sarah, we always say when we talk about social media, every social media platform has a different personality and a different constituency that uses that. And you can't have a monolithic approach to your communications in that way. So the, your personality on your blog shouldn't necessarily be the same as it is on Instagram or Snapchat. Reach different audiences by having a different uh, personality. Yeah. So this is fantastic. And, and the, uh, their watermark, the LACMA watermark, is not offensive to me in these situations. No, it's very tasteful. Very tasteful. <laughs> very tasteful. <laughs> um, the Little League World Series is going on right now. And a 13-year-old girl who throws a 70-mile-an-hour fastball, um, which in adult terms, because the, the, the pitcher's mound in Little League is closer than in the major leagues, it's the equivalent of throwing a fastball in the low 90s, which would make her eligible to be a major league baseball player if, in fact, she kept progressing. Uh, the girl's name is Monet Davis. They were, her team, unfortunately, was eliminated last night. Um, but she threw the first no-hitter. She's the first girl to throw a no-hitter in Little League World Series history, and she is the first Little Leaguer to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated um, with this great pitching image by Al Thielmans, who's a friend of ours. Um, just a, really cool to see. I know. She's a, she's a badass. <laughs> she's kind of, so I, I saw a statistic that said she's basically the reason why people are watching Little League this year. The ratings are up 143% because of Monet, which is, That's you know, awesome. go for it. And, you know, there was concern. People were like, well, you know, Sports Illustrated, uh, their whole thing is we hope to see her again on the cover. Um, and people were like, oh, that's very nice of you to say, but obviously that's not going to happen again. Turns out her coach says she's a better basketball player than she is a baseball player. Yeah, I was reading that she wants to do basketball instead yeah. of baseball. She wants to go to UConn, which has been the national champs for years and years and years, um, and be a point guard. So go for it, Monet. Go for it. Congratulations on your cover. <laughs> Sarah, we've been talking about Honey for a long time. Oof, yes we have. And we even <laughs> talked about it last week because Honey was over in Iraq. Humans of New York, Brandon Stanton. And College Humor, which is one of the many humor sites and a snarkier one out there, um, put this together. It's called Assholes of New York. And because I said that, now I'm going to have to rate this PG-13 when I post it to iTunes. Um, it really has nothing to do with photography, but I, <laughs> you know, because we talked about uh, the power of Honey's storytelling, and that's what makes it so compelling. The, you know, the way that he extracts these one or two liners out of people and edits them down and makes them very profound. And I came across this um, Assholes of New York. And so uh, what they did, College Humor took actual Honey photos and then created captions for them. <laughs> that um, are just yeah. hilarious. So this first one is this guy in a Yankees cap. You know, it's so typical, but, you know, guy in a hoodie and a Yankees cap <laughs> uh, in, in a bar or riding a subway or whatever. So the question is, have you ever been in love? Uh, I'm sorry? Have you ever been in love? Hey, do me a favor and shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just perfect. Classic all, New York. Yeah. Like, way more New York than, than Honey. Yeah, they're all just, hey, man, leave me alone. What you, what's your problem? Get out of my way. 
I imagine that when Honey started, he had a lot of these. You're probably why, right. Why are you taking my picture? Right. Get out of my face. <laughs> these are definitely worth reading. Yeah. And had I had more time, I would have looked up the original quotes because I think juxtaposed that that would be even better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, the last one is very fun. We have to show the last one because the last one is, you know, Fashion Kid. <laughs> um, here's Fashion Kid. Oh. And the quote says, my dad could buy your whole family. <laughs> Which is probably true. <laughs> definitely true. Oh, good times. Uh, I downloaded this app today. Oh, you did? Actually, I downloaded it last night. This is called the Google I uh, Photosphere. Now, back in the day, uh, Apple had a similar technology called QuickTime VR. And QuickTime VR allowed you to make kind of a 360 view of the world um, and a little bit of tilt up and down. But Google actually allows you to make an entire sphere of your world. And the way it works is you take a photo and there's a little orange dot. And you just have to align your photo with the orange dot. And then, you, then it takes the photo automatically for you. And then it just stitches together this sphere of your world. Who wants and a panoramic view anymore? That just went out the window with this app. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the issue is that, you know, to view it, you have to use your device and you kind of spin around. And, and you can upload these to Google Maps. And their hope is to, to get these sphere views of the world, which I think is really cool. I did it at the airport this morning. Um, indoors, it doesn't work as well because things are too close to you and, and people are moving. It works really well on like scenic landscapes and whatnot. Got it. Oh, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, and I'm sure realtors will want to be. Oh, realtors, they would love this. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's utility for this stuff. You know, I was looking at the sphere view and then I was comparing it to real life, and, you know, real life is better. <laughs> But if really? you can't be there, <laughs> sphere view is not bad. Okay. You just don't get the entire grandeur, but this is as good as I've seen for, you know, picking up a, a spot. Okay, but conclusion, real life is better. Conclusion, real life is better, <laughs> but in the meantime, you know, it's worthwhile. You know, the, the app works really, really well. It's worth downloading, and if you don't care about your privacy, because it's going to GPS everything, and then you upload it, and, you know, if you don't claim copyright for taking a photosphere then it can be in the public domain or whatever. Uh, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm going to try it a few more times here in New York and, and see what's up, and then I'll probably delete it from my phone. Yeah, Google. Speaking of more technology, this is cool. Look at this. This is called Planet Labs. Planet Labs is launching these lunchbox size uh, satellites with the intent to take real-time photos of the Earth. Is this the new... Uh, quadcopter drone? This Maybe. is kind of the new drone. <laughs> they, they said there, there's obviously a lot of satellites uh, uh, that take photos of the Earth. You know, Google Maps having the satellite Google Earth and all these views. And in and, and the newspaper, almost every day, we see some sort of satellite view. But those satellites are only taking photos of the Earth kind of like on a monthly basis. So the photos are only being updated on a monthly basis. Planet Labs is trying to give you sort of real-time continuous imagery, which, as you can imagine, will have a lot of utility. Everything from, oh, just, you know, realtor wants to get a shot, to military wants to see what's going on, to disaster happens, we need to see what's going on on the ground. Like wildfires. Yeah. And this particular, so this is on New York Mag, and the author, Kevin Roos, writes a lot about technology, and he's actually really excited about this, because he's like, I'm so sick of all of these apps that do nothing. They're just pieces of software that do nothing. And he mentions this app, Yo, which I've tried. Yo is like a SMS. It's a, it's a messaging app, but all you can do is say yo to your friend. And the only thing your friend can do back is say yo. And yo raised a million dollars and has a $10 million valuation, and all it does is, is say yo. So the author is so psyched that this is like a real tangible thing that real scientists are building in the United States of America and then launching it up into space and then taking photos. And then they have some sample photos down here. Which are beautiful. They're beautiful. 
Yeah, I'm, aerial photographers are going to love this stuff. Yeah. So, I, and I'm all for this Planet Labs thing. My only concern is there are, there's a lot of space junk up there. We know this from talking to Don Pettit. Right, yeah. We know yeah. this from reading articles. Do we need, like, you know, a thousand lunchboxes up there? <laughs> right, right. I saw Red gravity. Satellites. Could, yeah. I feel like they could be eaten by, I don't know, other things that are up there. <laughs> like other satellites yes, could aliens. just crash right into them. And, and the aliens, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You found this from my alma mater. Yes. The Photogrammer. The Photogrammer, yes. This, uh, this new site was created by a group of researchers at Yale, and it maps out and organizes... Um, 170,000 images that were taken by the FSA between 1935 and 1945. Um, this is the best way to organize images. I mean, the Library of Congress owes them like a huge thank you <laughs> for doing this. You can, you can search by location or specific photographer if you want to see, you know, Dorothea Lange's work. Um, yeah. And you can map out their route that they did throughout the U.S. Um, and it's pretty cool to see some of the outtakes, I mean, so many of these images have been buried and buried. Um, I mean, we know, obviously, there are a lot of iconic images that, that came out of that time. Yep. But it's interesting to see, like, Dorothea Lange's, like, you know, just random pictures of, of farmers. I mean, she wasn't getting fabulous shots all the time, and for yeah. some reason that is reassuring to me. <laughs> and, and all of these images are in the public domain because your grandparents' taxes paid for it. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. You know, I was looking at the about, the team, and it's fascinating to see. So, professor of American Studies, American Studies, these G's, 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 specialist, PhD in statistics, librarian for digital humanities. Uh, it took a lot of different disciplines to pull this together, and it's, it's pretty fascinating, um, the visualization you know, people, I, I guess Google figured this out very, very early on, but, the, but, but maps are so important. And when you can start throwing data uh, against a map, it just raises the utility. And, you know, when you're a kid and you're learning about geography, geography to you is like memorizing the 50 states. And then later on you learn geography is also about natural resources and that's why countries fight you know over water and states fight over water and this is why these cities succeed because they're at a certain latitude and there's a nice port and then you look at this stuff which is you know everything from Yelp to to this throwing stuff on a map and and getting sort of an extra layer of information out of out of the data it's really really fascinating just don't <laughs> Don't put this as a feature request for uh, for photo shelter because this this took like a lot of PhD power to come up with and it's just not in our core mission. But you know maybe one day I think I think that when when you know when you're 65 and you retire as a photographer you you should get this automatically. Yale should should put all your your photos into this map for you, and then you can publish it online. You can tweet it out. That'd be cool. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Um, so, if you're a foodie, if you're a foodie, you probably hate that term. But if you're a foodie and you enjoy eating, then you've probably heard of the French Laundry. And if you've heard of the French Laundry, you know that it's uh, one of the best restaurants in the world. Thomas Keller is the chef. <coughs> Excuse me. Over on the Bold Italic, which is a magazine about the San Francisco Bay Area, kind of a lifestyle magazine, they started doing this thing, which is food reviews, restaurant reviews by four-year-olds. <laughs> And this particular one is this very cute girl uh, named, uh, I forget what her name is, uh, Lila Hogan. And they took her to French Laundry. So uh, let me explain to you French Laundry. Uh, I, I just ate there a few months ago. French Laundry, uh, it's, it's like a 20-course meal. It takes like three to four hours to eat. Um, it is fantastic, but it's also kind of hot cuisine, if you will. Like the food is delicious, but it's not a hamburger. Hmm. So they took, we're talking small portions. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and we're talking like, you know, <laughs> with, with wine, we're talking anywhere from $400 and up. And they took a four-year-old. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> and the reservation takes, you know, if, if you can get one, it takes six to eight weeks to get the reservation. So they took a four-year-old. Now, what does this have to do with photography? Well, the, first of all, the, the girl is so cute, and the review is just very funny, the way that they, they, they uh, quote her. But I thought that the photography was actually great, and I like the way that the photography was used to show her reaction. Yeah, it's the entire review. It, and, it, you know, four-year-olds, they're going to wear their feelings right on their face. Yeah. So it's perfect. <laughs> and, of course, it, it's helped by the caption. I like the white part better than the green part, but even if you didn't have that, you can sort of <laughs> tell what's up. And, Sarah, when we talk about photography as a mode of communication, you know, in the same way that, like, emojis are like communication, you know, people have started, there's a... There's a uh, uh, emoji version of Moby Dick. Um, and similarly, like, f visuals can be used to, to tell a story and be used in communication. And I just thought that this was such a wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> you know, like, she's like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, the, the photography, I can see, is a little challenging because there's mixed temperature. There's, they're next to a window, but there's clearly an incandescent light that's shining on them. Um, but it's fantastic. She passed on the caviar. It looks really not good, yeah. she says. <laughs> it's great. So this has been kind of being passed around in, in the foodie the foodie world right now, but it's such a great concept. Yeah, I, I had not heard of the French laundry. Yeah. So I'm not now a foodie. You know. yeah, now I know. <laughs> now you know. We end this week with a wonderful, wonderful set of photos. You found this, and I was going through these, and they're just great. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of bittersweet because summer is technically coming to an end, and so I think that that in the dog days of summer, we look at this stuff and we get a little wistful um, as a place that has seasons and as a place that had a brutally cold winter. But these photos uh, by a Brooklyn guy, yeah, Brian Brooklyn guy. Dabala. Yeah, Brian Dabala. Yeah, these are just, like you said, super sweet images of just this I idealistic summer that I thought were great and something to lighten the mood after every heavy thing that we've talked oh, about. Gosh, yeah, I know. Brian, I love this one. I know, yeah. <laughs> nice like foreground, background element, girl in the bikini, the guy just like jumping <laughs> off the cliff. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, it's not it's not all beach scenes. It's like, you know, guy climbing on top of a fence and look how lush the 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 yard is or whatever that is. Yeah, he, he captured one great summer. This guy, Brian, was um, recognized this year in PDN's 30 Emerging uh, Yeah. Yeah, 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 I recognize his name. Yeah. Fantastic work, man. Yeah, just really fun and good. <laughs> well, at least we had a, a few nice things to celebrate about photography, starting with some not-so-great things that happened in photography this week. Yeah. Uh, the PG-13 edition this week. <laughs> yeah, we talked about assholes of New York. Uh, we had a photojournalist who was killed. Um, whew. It's always interesting to see what comes up week after week. But I guess that's, that's sort of life. And I guess that's why we love photography, Sarah. It is. It is indeed. All right, so thanks for joining us as usual, everyone. For Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.